Wall Street posts its second straight week of losses. Indices correct nearly 3% as recession fears mount after the Fed signals rates will remain higher for longer in order to bring inflation under control. Recession fears also weigh on oil prices. Brent crude falls over 2% on Friday, trades below the $81 a barrel mark as leading central banks remain aggressive in their fight against inflation. And an index rejig will see Tata Motors replace Dr. Reddy's on the Sensex. The move is likely to result in inflows worth $150 million for Tata Motors. Dr. Reddy's may see outflows to the tune of $112 million. And Lionel Messi and Argentina win the World Cup in a thrilling final. France stages a comeback after conceding two goals. But Mbappe's hat-trick goes in vain as Messi and co win the World Cup eight years after losing out in the finals of 2014. Hi guys, a very good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast. I'm Pavitra Parekh. Those were all of the top headlines that we are tracking this morning. I know it's clearly all about the World Cup. That's all anyone wants to talk about. And it's been a wonderful match. And we're going to get to that in just a minute from now. But first up, let me take you through what's going on with the global markets because there's lots of action there as well. So in Asia right now, you're actually seeing a pretty mixed open. So Hang Seng is the one which is doing quite well. It's up on your screen, nine tenths of a percent higher there. Taiwan, meanwhile, is seeing cuts of around half a percent, so very mixed across Asia. You also have Shanghai, which is open with cuts of around four tenths of a percent. Uh, the Nikkei market is actually faring the worst this morning, so they're down around 1.2 percent right now in early trade. That's the Japanese markets. So all in all, quite mixed. The SGX Nifty will come up for you on your screen. It is indicating a positive start for our own markets. Around 50 points higher is what we have for ourselves on the SGX Nifty. That's what's going on across Asia. But let's also talk about the U.S. markets then. Wall Street ended Friday's trading session lower with the Dow Jones and S&P both uh, closing around a percent in the red. The tech-heavy Nasdaq also came under pressure and ended the day with a cut of over 100 points. CNBC's Steve Kovac is here with a wrap of all of that action from Wall Street. Steve. Selling continued on Wall Street, although a late rally erased some of the day's losses. Investors are worried the Federal Reserve is so committed to fighting inflation with higher interest rates that it is prepared to put the economy into a recession if that's what it takes to control prices. The Dow closed down more than 280 points. It is on a two-week losing streak. The S&P finished 1.1 percent lower. The Nasdaq finished with a loss of almost 1 percent. CNBC has learned Goldman Sachs plans to cut up to 8% of its employees in January. That's around 4,000 jobs. It would be the biggest Wall Street workplace reduction so far. A recruiter tells us firms overhired, and now they have to overfire as business dries up. And it's going to cost you more, again, to get Ford's electric F-150 Lightning pickup truck. The entry-level model is now $55,000, up $4,000 from the previous price and 40% higher than its $40,000 price tag when it was first introduced. That's the action from the U.S. market. Back to you in Mumbai. All right, Steve, thanks a lot for getting us all of that action from Wall Street. In fact, staying with that, let's also bring you some important opinion coming in on the Fed's decision to really hike rates for longer and as well as, you know, where the markets are headed from here. This is from Jeremy Siegel, Liz Ann Saunders, as well as Chief Economist of KPMG, Diane Swank. Listen in. I think the Fed is making a terrible mistake. Uh, their, their plan, their dot plot is way too tight. Uh, Inflation is basically over, uh, despite the way Chairman Powell characterizes it. Uh, and we could go into that if you want. Uh, you know, I say over 90 percent is over. And with the bulk of monetary policy, uh, as he himself admits, is yet to be felled, uh, I see no reason to go any higher than we are now. In fact, I wouldn't have gone as high, but it's a done deal, certainly what happened earlier this week. But uh, the talk of going higher and staying high through 2023, I think, would guarantee a very steep uh, recession. He fears wages as an inflationary force. Well, first of all, wages since the pandemic have not matched the increase in prices. The real worker wages have gone down. I, it's hard for me to see they're pushing inflation up when they don't even match inflation. It is not the Fed's job to, to suppress the economy because there is a structural supply shift. The cycle doesn't care about the calendar, but I think 
we, we, the medicine still needs to be taken, and by that, it's weaker economy, weaker labor market, uh, very clearly shared by the Fed as a most likely serious and necessary ingredient in the recipe to get inflation down. Therefore, I think sooner rather than later is the better time to take the medicine because it does set the stage for maybe not a pivot, uh, but, a, but at least a pause for the Fed to uh, reassess. So I, I think there's still more downside in terms of earnings estimates. There's still more weakness to come in the labor market. We're starting to see some of those uh, cracks. But I think from a market perspective, we're better served to have it happen sooner, not later. If we were to have, a, and, and I don't think a recession is a good thing, but I think the Fed is already planning on a recession. I mean, let's, you know, not split hairs here. I mean, when they're talking about a 1% increase in the unemployment rate, which I think is going to go higher than that anyways, um, and stalling out the economy, that's a hard landing for a lot of firms. And the idea that the Fed is pushing so un, in, in unison, again, there was a little shine of light between people within the Fed. Now they're all on the same page again because they're really worried about that underlying inflation and getting to a floor that we can't go below. And that's important. And the good news is a Fed-induced recession is easier to recover from, but we're not talking about, if at all possible, the Fed does not want to go back to zero rates. All right, that is some interesting opinion coming in, and that's what we're tracking as far as global markets go. But let's now talk about all of the cues that you should look at as we get into a fresh trading week. We have our research team here with the trade set up. Ekta, Nigel, and Vaishra all join me now. Guys, a very good morning to all of you. And Ekta, let me come across to you first. Uh, last week was really not the best for our own markets, but how is it looking as we get into this one? Thanks for that. Well, you know, the global queues seem to be similar and there are not many queues simply because uh, the markets are drying up in terms of queues simply because it is towards the close of the year. Uh, the markets for last week closed lower for the second consecutive week. In fact, the markets were at one month lows. The decline was in line with what we've seen with global markets. The street is fearing global recessions, aggressive rate hikes from the Fed as well as other central banks. Now, FII's net sold as well on Friday's trading session. DII's net bought um, quite significantly, but nonetheless, it was a net sell figure which came in from the institutions. Central bank tightening, we had the US Fed which raised rates by 50 basis points, Bank of England as well, as well as the ECB. All of this took place last week, so it seems as though inflation, global recession fears is the large cue that the street is working with. Expect a largely quiet week on account of the holiday season. The street is possibly watching for maybe a Santa Claus rally, so let's see whether that comes through. U.S. closed lower on Friday. We had the global composite PMI flash data as well, which was lower on a month-on-month -month basis. So do watch out for that. Asia largely mixed. SGX indicating that maybe there could be some amount of a positive start. So let's see whether that sustains. And crude oil, that's working in our favor. Below $80, fears of a global slowdown is weighing on that one as well. It would be a net-net positive for the macros of the Indian economy. All right, Ekta, thanks a lot for taking us through all of those cues this morning. But uh, with that, let's also talk about the individual names you should have on your radar today. Vahishta is here with an entire weekend's worth of news flow coming in. Uh, Vahishta, over to you. Thank you, Pavitra. Let me start off with uh, l &T, which is planning to sell its entire 51% stake in infrastructure development projects, which is a joint venture between l &T and Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. And the gross proceeds to l &T and CPPIB from the divestment would be at approximately 2,700 crores. Moving on to the IT pack, we know that Accenture results were out on Friday post-market. Q1 FI23 year-on-year revenue growth came in at 15%, which is ahead of the company's guidance of 10 to 14%. But the new bookings have come in at $16.2 billion, which has declined 3% on a near-near basis and were also down 12% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Also, the company has said that there is rising cautiousness among the clients with a focus on cost optimization projects. With this, we expect the entire IT pack to be in focus today. Another IT stock that we talk about, Mastic, which makes a strategic investment in Waltio Edge, uh, which is a SaaS company. It's an edge intelligence company in the connected enterprise space. GMM Fodler, the promoter group Fodler INC, has sold 17.32% through bulk deals at 1,700 rupees per share. And post the sale, the Patel family has become the single largest promoter shareholder in the company. Also, the Patel family has entered into an arrangement to purchase 1% equity shares from uh, Fodler INC. 
Moving on, Tata Motors, Bangalore Tra Metropolitan Transport Corporation has signed a definitive agreement with the company's fully owned subsidiary TML Smart City Mobility Solutions. This is for the operation of 921 electric buses in Bangalore. GMR Airports Infrastructure, a step down subsidiary uh, GMR Airports, has received 13. 90 crores against the sale of shares in GMR Megawide Sebo Airport Corporation Specialty re Restaurants. A board meeting will be held to consider the raising of funds on the 21st of December and the last talk is Phoenix Mills, which will be acquiring 7.22 acre land parcel in Surat to develop premium retail destination for approximately 500 crores. Back to you. All right, Vaishta, that is a long list. So thank you for bringing up to speed with all of that action. But let's also talk about the futures and options space. And Nigel is standing by with all of the cues. Hi, Nigel. Well, morning. You know, on Friday morning, the call was to be a little bit cautious on the Nifty. And it played out perfectly because all the rallies got sold into in Friday's session. If you look at the intraday chart, well, the Nifty ended at the low point of the day. The Nifty Bank, though, was a relative outperformer. That ended closer to around the 20 DMA out mark. There was, uh, you know, no big shorting, actually. There was more unbinding of long positions that we saw in a Friday's trading session. So we did see uh, that on the Nifty and the Nifty Bank, there was shedding of open interest and both of them ended low. And that perfectly ties in with what the FIs did. They lightened their position both on the long as well as on the short side. In fact, on the short side, they covered some of their short positioning, close to around 5,000 contracts or were closed out, though they continue to remain net long, marginally so though. 55, 56% of their positions now are on the long side. On the index option side, well, there's no big direction coming out there because they were active both on the call and the put side on the buying as well as on the writing side. The problem is they continue to write calls very aggressively, telling you that higher levels will see some supply. And in Friday's trading session, the 18,400 call and the 18,300 call, you put both of them together, they added close around a crore shares odd. And it gives you the resistance zone of around 18,400 to around 18,450. On the downside, the 18,000 put that opened up and it appears there was some, you know, cushion buying out there. In case things go wrong, well, they'll make some money on that side. So what are the levels you're looking at? You know, the SGX if we're suggesting a gap up, my guess is that you shouldn't be chasing this, uh, this gap up. You'd rather wait for an intraday dip and look to buy somewhere closer to around the 50 DMA, maybe with a stop loss at around 18,050. But a fresh breakout on the Nifty will come only once we get past the 20 DMA. That's at around 18,530. On the Nifty Bank, well, there was a writing that we saw in Friday's trading session. It ended closer on the 20 DMA. So in case, let's see whether or not that can play a good inning, so to call it, and support the Nifty. That's going to be the key. As she if you suggest a 50-point gap up, I'll tell you what, the bulls would have preferred a 50-point gap down. But let's see how this goes. Back to you. All right, let's see how the trading session pans out. Nigel, Ekta, Vaishta, thank you very much for joining us and taking us through the trade setup this morning. We are going to get into a short break now. But when we come back, we're tracking lots of stock-specific action. We're going to bring you all of the details after the short break. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast. Now, an, an important update for the IT sector. Outsourcing giant Accenture reported Q1 FY23 earnings. So, Reema is here to fill us in with all of the details. Reema. Thanks so much for that. So, Q1 FY23 numbers from Accenture were strong. Revenue growth of 15% is ahead of street expectations and ahead of the company's own guidance of 10 to 14%. In the top line, the outsourcing revenues, which is where the Indian IT companies play, that growth was strong at 20%. The weakness was actually in the consulting space, which is seen more discretionary. For FY23, Accenture has gone ahead and maintained its full-year revenue guidance of 8 to 11%. Some would say, uh, the bears would say, that despite a strong Q1, the why has the company not gone ahead and upped the guidance? Is that a negative read-through? But on the flip side, the bulls would say that despite the macroeconomic uncertainty, the company has gone ahead and maintained the guidance, and that in itself is a positive. But one thing is very clear, the deal bookings have seen a slowdown. So the new deal wins had declined 3% on a year-on-year -year basis, and look at the performance on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. At $16.2 billion, it's sharply lower than the more than $18 billion figure that we had in the prior quarter. So deal wins are slowing down. Now let's tell you what the key takeaways for the Indian IT companies are. The Accenture gives you an annual guidance and it also gives you the next quarter's guidance. So if you take that into account, uh, the implied second half of the year growth, which equates to the first half of FI24 growth for the Indian IT companies, is likely to be you know, fairly downbeat. Accenture's own revenue growth seems to suggest that the company is only going to see about a 55 to 9.5% revenue growth. There is rising caution among clients with a focus on cost optimization projects. Attrition has seen a sharp fall. 
dipped at 13%, versus 20% of prior quarter, which indicates supply side situation is easing and there is a slowdown in smaller deals, which could be negative for the mid tier IT companies. Back to you. All right, so let's see how the entire IT pack does. Reema, thanks a lot for taking us through all of the highlights from Accenture's earnings. But the next stock that we are tracking is LNT because they continue with their strategy of divestment from uh, non core businesses and will now divest 51% stake in LNT IDPL. So Vivek is here to tell us more about that. Vivek? Well, good morning. Absolutely right. You know, this is in line with their stated strategy to exit their non core investments. And now what they've done is they held a 51% stake in a company called as LNT IDPL, which is LNT Infrastructure Development Projects Limited. Now, this is actually a JV between the company as well as the Canadian CPPIB, Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. The gross proceeds, you know, to both of the companies after this particular deal is going to be a little over 2,700 crores. So not very material in terms of the inflow as far as LNT is concerned. But uh, what brokerages are saying is that, you know, Jeffries is indicating that this particular deal indicates that the company continues its part to actually going ahead and divesting non-core assets. Important to watch, you know, what is the way forward as far as NABA power as well as the Hyderabad Metro uh, proceeds are concerned. Uh, Macquarie has a very similar uh, uh, sentiment. What they're saying is that the next focus will be on support from the state of Hyderabad as far as the Metro is concerned, as well as real estate monetization plans that the company could have around the Hyderabad Metro project. All right, Vivek, thanks a lot for getting us all of the details on this, on LNT divesting stake in IDPL. But with that, we are going to get into a short break now. On the other side, we're tracking all of the cues from the commodity market. Welcome back to Power Breakfast. Let's talk about the commodity space now because there's lots going on there. Even as global markets might be a little bit quiet, there's lots going on in the world of commodities. Manisha is here to fill us in. Hi, Manisha. Morning, Pavitra. Thank you for that. Well, yes, uh, you know, even as we get another, and on, on to another week and the volumes uh, and the, the participation would continue to decline. But what we are seeing right now is a lot of headlines coming in from China where uh, we are looking at higher COVID cases. And there are now reports suggesting that uh, we could be looking at 1.5 million people uh, go under COVID if immediate steps are not taken. And that really seems to be hurting the commodity markets right now. So the metal prices clearly have continued to decline. Copper prices, which fell 3.5% in the previous week, have started Asian market on a weaker note right now as well. Apart from the Chinese COVID cases, which are weighing on the demand, it is a major central bank signaling higher interest rates from here. Is the reason the latest report from Capital Economics says that the first quarter of 2023 could start on a weaker note for metals, and for copper, they are expecting $7,000 a ton to be hit as well. Some gains, though, was what have we have seen come in for the crude oil prices. It gained 4% in the previous week. We are trading in the positive right now as well. As the markets look at the U.S., which is looking to replenish the emergency reserves, it will start with 3 million barrels. Remember, the U.S. Uh, strategic petroleum reserves are at a 30-year lows, and with U.S. buying crude in the open market, that could be a supportive factor. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for getting us all of the action on crew prices. But with that, let's move on and talk about the World Cup final. This was one for the ages. Lionel Messi's Argentina edged France to lift the World Cup on a penalty shootout. Earlier, Argentina had taken a 2-0 lead, but a brace from Mbappe saw France take the tie to extra time. Argentina took the lead in extra time through Messi only for Mbappe to complete his hat-trick and equalize yet again. Argentina then won after goalkeeper Emi Martinez's heroics in the penalty shootout. Our colleague Shibani was actually in Doha for the final and she got in a mood check on the Argentinian fans after the final. So take a look. What a night, what a match as penalty shootout decides the winner of the FIFA Football World Cup 2022. Behind me are Argentinian fans. I know their excitement will meet Mati. and reach new levels. How do you feel about Argentina winning the FIFA World Cup 2022? Great. It was great. Uh, we win and we are very happy. Okay. Uh, taking home the trophy after 36 years, yes. how does that feel? It's amazing. And it's amazing because I am with my son. It's very, very beautiful. Really unforgettable. Like Messi is the best player in football history and and no words can describe him. And phenomenal support for the Argentinian team in the stadium. Do you think they fed off the energy and played yes. so well because of that? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. We are very, very excited. And everyone singing the anthem. Okay. Come on. Again. 
Dale campeón, dale campeón, dale campeón, dale campeón, dale campeón, dale campeón. That is the kind of excitement the loser stadium. You know that the kind of energy and support that Urgentine fans had for their team inside, and they definitely fed off that energy and took home the World Cup. All right, that is some insane energy. In fact, it was palpable all the way here, you know, even if you check it out through a TV screen. But that was definitely a match for the ages. On that very happy note, we're going to wind down on this edition of Power Breakfast. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Bazaar Morning Call is up in two.